news tonight on... The Australian TV industry is on its financial knees, but pressure is mounting to introduce four new pay TV networks. We're about the only Western country now that doesn't have pay television or isn't about to get it. The promise is greater choice without a drop in quality. But what will it cost and who will own the licenses? View now, pay later. That's our story tonight. Live from Canberra, the ABC's Lake Line. Here's Kerry O'Brien. Welcome to the program. Every developed Western nation has pay TV in some form, except Australia. There's plenty of support for it here. The latest survey has more than one in three Australians who would like to have pay TV. There's also great opposition from the commercial networks, which don't want the competition, particularly at this critical point in their own struggle for financial viability, and from the $600 million a year home video market, which would face severe losses of its movie consumers. And then there are the critics who say that more TV will mean worse TV. The last time the government looked at pay TV four years ago, the decision was to delay. Now it's decision time again. The various proposals and options are on the desk of Communications Minister Kim Beasley, who must decide in the next month or so. Our story starts by looking at those proposals and options. Here's Mark Bannerman. Australian television viewers currently have five TV networks to choose from. Following Neighbours tonight on 10, Candid Camera on Australia. Two of those networks are in dire financial trouble, and the only specialist service, SBS, currently rates less than 2% of the available audience. Despite those problems, the push is now on to bring Australia four new networks, paid for this time by subscribers. And the reason is simple. To give the people the choice of watching the type of program that they want to. And that might mean watching free-to-air, or watching a movie on pay TV, or perhaps 24-hour news service. Or if they want to watch a movie station and have no news, that they can have that choice as well. So they want freedom of choice. This is a television revolution. A revolution in quality entertainment. A revolution in choice. Now in one stroke, Sky Television more than doubles the programs on offer to you. And it's quality all the way. Supporters of pay television point to a recent BIS shrapnel survey that shows 64% of Australians know about pay TV. And of those, 60% want to use it. Research also shows a potential audience of 1 million pay TV users. The survey results shouldn't surprise anyone. Most have tasted pay TV watching Sky Channel or other sports networks in clubs and hotels. Four years ago, the then Communications Minister, Michael Duffy, placed a moratorium on pay television. The new minister, Kim Beasley, has to decide for or against the service. If he gives it the go-ahead, he'll have his supporters in the Labor Party. I think on balance, there is a case for it. We're about the only Western country now that doesn't have pay television or isn't about to get it. There's no shortage of business people ready to cash in on a new industry. Potential players include Glenn Wheatley, former rock star and FM radio king. Rupert Murdoch's News Limited, owners of Sky TV in Britain. Telecom, currently developing fibre optic cables. And George Frame's independent television in Newcastle. Smaller operators like George Frame would need joint ventures with the big movie companies. And that in itself presents certain problems for the government in the area of foreign investment. But the toughest question may well be which delivery system to use. The front runner has to be satellite. It's currently used by Sky Channel here. It's broadcast using OSAT's domestic satellite and picked up on dishes like this one. OSAT, at least, believe it has the advantage of being able to begin as early as 1992. The fact is that there's no alternative but to go to a satellite-delivered system in the first, well, probably until the year 2000, until fibre optics are actually developed uh, to a stage where it can really pass most of the people's homes in Australia. It's Monday morning in the dealing room of the Australian Industry Development Corporation. Dealers are waiting for the latest Bureau of Statistics figures. That information will come to them via a microwave communication system called Multipoint Distribution Service, or MDS. The microwaves are sent from Centrepoint Tower in Sydney 
to this receiver on the roof of the AIDC building when it's transmitted to the screens in the dealing room. It's a simple, cheap system that can also be used for the delivery of pay television. Satellites are extremely expensive. The satellite transponder that is used to broadcast the signal costs a great deal, maybe in the vicinity of $8 million a year just for, the, for one, for one t uh, television signal. Now, with this system of ours, the MDS, you haven't got those sort of costs. The transmitter, for example, costs about fifty dollars or $60,000 to install. Once you've got that, and then you start installing the home systems, that's, you've got a complete system straight away. The multi-point distribution system is already used to provide in-house information for guests in hotels right across Sydney. In this case, the signal comes from the centre point tower to the top of the building, and then it's fed into the in-house television service for use by tourists in the hotel. Now, it's a system very much like this that the Wheatley organisation would like to see used to provide pay television services to homes right across Australia. This may look like a giant plumbing job. In fact, this machine is laying down the basic network for cable pay TV in Australia. These fibre optic cables made of glass and developed by telecom will ultimately replace the normal wires that connect our telephone services. They can also be used to provide pay television and the system has its supporters. When households are connected to the optical fibre telephone system, cable television can be provided at very low cost indeed and, so, and at very high quality. And so because of that low cost, high quality availability of a transmission system, there's much more point in having pay television then. Whether it's satellite, microwave, or cable pay TV, only Kim Beasley knows. But media analyst Peter Cox has one final warning. The government needs to do an economic assessment of each of the alternative systems. This has not been done so far as an imperative to determining which is the most suitable way to go. So let's hear from some of the interest groups who've been currently uh, presenting their cases to the federal government. Len Major is a senior television executive and chairman of FACTS, the Federation of Australian Commercial Television Stations. Len Wheatley is a major contender for a pay TV licence. He's managing director of the Wheatley organisation and was until recently the owner of a string of successful FM radio stations as well as the Hoyts movie house. Glenn Wheatley, the proposal that you would most want, you contend as I understand it, that, that, that there is only room for one licensee and if you were the licensee, you would have four channels. You would have sport, movies, news, and children's television. Well, a, a combination of children's arts entertainment channel, yes. Now, what, uh, what would that give Australians that uh, current television stations don't already supply? Well, I think it gives them a diversity of choice more than anything. And I think that this is really uh, the debate that uh, has been going uh, ad nauseum now for so long. I must point out that I'm not a, a main advocate for MDS. That is one form of delivery. Uh, the delivery system really is not the issue that we should be discussing uh, at length here, because I think the issue is really uh, getting the government to, to come to grips with the fact that I think it's time that pay television was introduced into Australia. And uh, more importantly, let's look at the consumer side of it, because I think there is a demand. There is confusion out in the marketplace, but I think there is a demand for pay TV into this country. And I think that the, the time is, is right now that it should be delivered. OK, well, let's concentrate on what your network of channels would give us. You tell me what your sporting network would give me that uh, channels 9, 7 and 2 and 10 wouldn't give me. Well, ESPN is, is the major sporting network in America, for example. Now, they operate 24 hours a day. Now, our subscription uh, uh, program in this country, I think, is going to give uh, a lot more diversity of choice to people. A sporting network, for example, well, we'd have to cover the, the, the events that the mainstream, the free-to-air TV uh, channels, do not cover. Like, it, like what? Well, well, in America, for example, ESPN uh, runs Australian football. So in Australia, you'd be running American football? Maybe. I mean, there, there, there is a variety of choices. There's a lot of uh, sports that don't get aired on free TV uh, simply because they don't have the room in their programming formats. OK, and as far as your mo movie channel would go, what's that going to give us that we're not going to get by a combination of... Uh, of the home video uh, supply plus uh, the commercial networks? Well, we've got, uh, it gives us a different window. In America, we've had pay TV now over there for 20 years. Video came after pay TV. 
In this country, it's going to be the reverse. What we've got now is a, vid is a, a video system out in the marketplace that will probably get knocked around a little bit with the introduction of pay because a movie channel certainly is going to have its viewers and certainly going to have its attractions. But like America, I think Australia can adapt and will adapt to this new medium. But I still, I still want to know why it's going to give me something better. I mean, all you're telling me is that you're going to deliver some of the movies into my home that I can get by just driving down the road and picking up a video at the corner store for four or five bucks. Uh, well, yes, but you can see this at any time you like. You don't have to go down to the corner store. And I think that there is also made and paid for view television uh, movies. And it's a whole new uh, business that has developed in America since the advent of pay TV. And I must say that there is some 150 uh, specially made for television movies that have never gone to, the, uh, to theatrical. Okay. When we look at your, your news, news and other, I mean, you've, you've got a kind of hodgepodge of, of children, arts and, uh, and education. Now, those two channels are really not much more than motherhood, are they, to, uh, to help give you a window dressing to persuade uh, Labor's, Labor's caucus to give you a monopoly licence? Well, I don't think that uh, the, the word monopoly is, is quite appropriate here because there's a lot more that's got to be looked at. The fact is, I believe that... Uh, the first part of your question is right, yes. I think that to give the... The, the balance of choice, I think that uh, the person who gets a, a license should balance it out besides the obvious ones of movies and sport. I think that news and the children's one are the expensive ones. And to get licensees in their own right to want to get one of those licenses, I doubt very much whether you get too many uh, takers because there's going to be a lot of years in the making before they can even break even, let alone see a profit. And how can you give a guarantee to anybody that you would pour the kind of money into a news uh, channel uh, that would guarantee a quality of news? Well, it's simply because if we don't, then no one's going to watch us. And but, if are no one... going, but are you going to really care whether they watch or not when what you're really making your money from is your sporting channel and your movie channel? No, because they, they'll, they'll come onto the lot. You'll pay one subscription, say $35 a month, that is going to give you the access to those four channels. Now, if you don't like what you're watching, then there's a monthly referendum. You simply just don't pay. And then you, you, we have the choice. I mean, if we're not supplying a good enough program, then we won't be getting any viewers. We won't be able to survive. OK, Len Major, if I could uh, introduce you now, uh, can you tell me why Australians shouldn't have pay TV? One of the main reasons, as far as the industry is concerned, is that we believe that it should wait, as we've always said, if it is to be introduced, till after the equalisation has settled down. The aggregation in the regional areas, so that those people in those areas can have three services, is taking a little longer than was first anticipated, is certainly a great deal more expensive than was first anticipated, and any further intrusion into their audience would, of course, help them, hurt them immensely. Tell me what would happen to the commercial networks if Glenn Wheatley's proposition got off the ground. Well, initially, I don't think it, it, it would have a great effect on us uh, as far as ratings are concerned. I take it it's purely subscription. Uh, and uh, I uh, congratulate uh, Glenn on being uh, so enthusiastic about it. Certainly, if you look at the introduction of uh, pay TV in the United Kingdom, uh, Mr Murdoch's Sky Channel lost £141 million, pounds, that's near $300 million in the first year. Uh, it's over £100 uh, million pounds in the second year, that's $200 million, basically. And it looks like being around about $75 million in the third year. BSB, when they set up uh, their satellite service for pay service with four channels, the uh, estimated cost of the, the setup was £750 million. Pounds. That's $1.5 billion. It's not easy. There's a lot to be done, and uh, I don't think we're ready for it. It's precisely for that reason that I'm talking about having a one operator service in this country. We cannot allow to happen in this country what is happening in, in England at the moment. It is a disaster. There is no doubt about that. Why? Because there's two competing channels head-on with two incompatible systems. It, it's, it, it cannot be allowed to happen here. We must have some sort of regulatory control and, and have a uniformity of system in, in this country. And for that, I'm advocating that, the, that it, it gives to one licensee the ability with a, with a balanced consortium and a balanced set of programming and, a, and the knowledge of the marketplace to be able to get it out to the marketplace. I believe that if we're not... Uh, doing a, a repeat of what's happening in the UK at the moment, we can make it work, and possibly within a, sh a shorter time frame as four years. OK, and, and how, uh, how much lead time are you allowing where you're just losing money? I mean, how much money are you budgeting to lose before you start making profits? Uh, well, there'll be several hundred million dollars. But, but I mean, in ballpark terms, hundreds of millions? Yes. Right.
if... Let, it, but, sorry, Lynn, uh, I'm, I'm going to have to move on now simply because of time, but uh, I'd like to introduce the voice of program makers into this discussion. Kim Williams is chairman of the Australian Film Finance Corporation, as well as running his own production company. Kim Williams, welcome to the program. What's, Thanks, Kerry. What, uh, what are your prime concerns, if any, about pay TV? Uh, the, production in, the production industry has a variety of concerns. I think that they, they centre on several key issues. The first is the commercial viability and integrity of the existing television system, which enjoys modest regulation in international circumstances, which is sympathetic to the needs of a production industry, requiring, for example, minimum drama output. Secondly, there is a concern as to a pay service having some form of sympathetic regulation, which ensures that the Australian production industry is not left high and dry inside such an operating framework. And third, a general concern with the broadcasting landscape of Australia in order to ensure that any new service doesn't represent something which could represent massive commercial disruption to the existing industry and also to certain cultural and other, other considerations which have traditionally been a concern on the part of government in the introduction of any new service to um, a broadcasting environment. OK, well, before we continue the discussion, I'd like to uh, take a look and see what's happened after 15 years in the home of pay TV, the United States. The ABC's correspondent in Washington is Heather Hewitt. Cable television, looking at possibilities, looking beyond your imagination tomorrow. Today, cable TV is big business in the United States. The industry has worked its way into 58% of the nation's TV watching homes. That's 53 million households paying for access to programs like these. There are specialist channels for movies, sport, exercise classes, news around the clock, even advice on what to buy. We're going to take a look at some very pretty rugs, and these haven't been in inventory for quite some time. The Cable TV Marketing Association calls it freedom of choice in true American style. You have major networks who are totally advertising supported. They have to program to the mass audience in order to support themselves. Well, in a, in a society like ours and most around the world, people are becoming more individualistic. They're wanting more of what they wish to see, know, enjoy, learn. But America's three major commercial TV networks call it a shameful monopoly, which threatens their future. All broadcast stations and networks in the United States have only one source of revenue, which is basically the advertising revenue. And what cable is doing is fragmenting the audience to a point where uh, if this trend continues for another couple of decades, broadcasters may find themselves without adequate funds to provide this kind of local service, which is the hallmark of the American system of broadcasting. As for how the American experience might apply to Australia... The consumers will drive the future. And um, it's hard to say whether 16 million is enough to support it or not. But I think what you have to do is you have to ask the consumers. There will be upheaval for the kind of broadcasting system that you have. And if the regulators are not very careful, uh, it could undermine the ability of local stations and isolated communities to earn the kind of revenue that supports the programming that people have become accustomed to. Kim Williams, uh, pay TV in the United States may not have exactly enriched the culture, but has it made it any worse? Well, it certainly liberated a large amount of money for original production. Um, I think there's a danger in, in slavishly following American models and applying them to our domestic market when we have a population of 17 million and they have a, a population of well over 250 million. I think that's um, something which has permeated much discussion about a whole variety of consumer issues in Australia when it's entirely wrong-headed. The fact is that we have a fragile and comparatively dependent production climate in Australia and that is very intimately related to commercial regulation on the part of commercial television and the output of the ABC in concert with independent producers. And any new service that is introduced to Australia will certainly need to be sensitive to those issues. I, for one, would express an issue on the part of the production industry, which is of overriding concern, and that is if pay television is to be entirely unregulated, and certainly for understandable commercial reasons, pay potential pay providers would prefer for it to be unregulated. It represents a, um, 
a chink in the armour of the, the rather modest and sensitive regulation that already exists for commercial television in Australia, well, with potentially phenomenally deleterious consequences on domestic production. OK, well, let's just take that point up with Glenn Wheatley. Glenn, would you accept uh, the same kind of uh, constraints or obligations in terms of Australian content uh, as the commercial networks, for example, 50% with drama? Well, uh, that's unrealistic in the early years, and I'd like to just uh, point out that it took free TV uh, many years in Australia to get to that level as well. When they first started, they also had the same problem. They had to get penetration, and you had to get critical mass. And, uh, and without critical mass, without that, that volume of people out there, it's going to be very hard to survive. We, su we survive on subscription, and as we grow through the years, yes, I would like to see us develop Australian talent. There's no doubt about that. I don't think I've ever, ever opposed that. I think I've always stood for developing and encouraging Australian content, uh, be it FM radio or be it Australian music. Um, but, but, what about, but what about Kim Williams' concern that if you are gradually hurting, if you like, the, the existing commercial networks, and over time, as you build your audience up, you must have some impact on them, but at the same time, you are not putting further injection into local content. No, we, we, we must give injection to, to local content. I, I mean, to be specific, well, I put a program into, into the, uh, the Department of Communications and to the Minister, which shows that uh, I believe that we can be adding some 30% to Australian content of Australian-made movies. Now, that's over a period of years. Uh, we can't do that immediately. I mean, we'd go broke from day one. But I think that as we introduce the service and as we get that critical mass, yes, it's imperative that we do make an undertaking and that we have some self-regulation, but we also have some regulation. I'm not just looking for a free go here. I believe that we should be looking at the foreign ownership, cross-media ownership, all of those rules that, that imply today to broadcasters. Yes, we're giving ourselves those guidelines and we're accepting the fact that that's what the Minister is going to be expecting from us. Kim Williams? I, I, I think it's um, all well and good to, to testify to, to Glenn Wheatley's splendid record in terms of Australian issues, but obviously in looking at any media issue one has to look to other ownership possibilities and other environments. And unless a service has some kind of guarantee as to a percentage of the revenues available to a paid telecaster um, being attributed to, to domestic production, and unless there's some minimum hourly output requirement attaching to such a service, I believe that the service potentially could damage the kind of environment that exists for production here already. Uh, Len Major, one brief uh, closing comment from you. As far as um, Glenn's suggestion on Australian production, obviously if he's affecting the commercial services, we would have to look at our ability to continue the scale of Australian production. I think that's what Kim, uh, Kim is saying. Uh, this, uh, our Australian production. We may not be able to afford it. Are you, are you all, would you also argue that if uh, Glenn, certainly in the short term, is expecting uh, concessions as to Australian content, uh, that you would push for uh, the capacity to lower your own standards or your own, uh, your own contribution? Well, if it's commercially driven, that means if he's got advertising in it, well, quite frankly, we believe then he should be treated the same as any free-to-air broadcaster. Glenn, you're nodding your head. Uh, One I, very quick comment before I agree we go. With that. OK. Thanks very much, gentlemen. We're out of time. Before we put uh, pay TV to rest, it's worth a quick look at how the politics are likely to be played here in Canberra. And for that, Tom Burton joins us now from the press gallery. Four years ago, Tom was working as an advisor to Michael Duffy, then communications minister, who put the moratorium on, on the pay TV decision. Tom has since made telecommunications one of his specialties as a political reporter for the Sydney Morning Herald. Tom, uh, how is it going to be played out? Are we definitely going to see the moratorium go? Well, I think for sure, Kerry. Um, by the end of next month, uh, Cabinet has to take a decision on this matter. The moratorium um, ends on September 1. So Mr Beasley's at the moment looking at a number of proposals which have been de uh, developed by his department as to which way to go on pay TV. So uh, do you know what the department is recommending? Well, on our, in our paper tomorrow on page 1, we've got a story which says that the department is looking at a plan whereby it would use OSAT, would use OSAT's um, four beams and possibly six to give you um, the sort of programming choice that Glenn Wheatley was talking about. Um, the interesting part of this proposal is that the way people would pay for it is they would go down to their newsagent, they would buy a what's called a video crypt card. That's a little card, you pay your 30 bucks, say for three hours worth of movies, and you put it in your little black box on top of the television and you get your three hours worth of movies. Well, apart from the video crypt and the little black box, have you also got a small satellite dish in your backyard to bring the signal in? Indeed, quite a small one, much smaller than the ones you see on the pubs and clubs at the moment. Be about 50 centimetres in diameter and would probably cost around about $500.
Okay, so if, if I want more than uh, two or three hours viewing time in my top drawer ready to go, I've got to buy four or five or six of these uh, discs or crypts. Yes, well, that's part of the beauty of the proposal, that you can have them in your top drawer, and if you see a movie that's coming on and you want to watch it, well, you just put it in the machine. Okay, uh, Glenn Wheatley talked about uh, one licensee with four channels. How does that accord with what the uh, communications department is recommending? Well, the department's in a bit of a um, quandary over this one, so is the minister. It's very difficult to determine how you actually hand out these uh, very scarce channels, and there's going to be a lot of lobbying over the next six weeks, I think, as to how that might happen. The pressure on that might, in fact, delay that decision. Um, he can make a decision to lift the moratorium, but because the, uh, the OSAT satellite doesn't go up to next year, he can take some time over how he actually decides on allocating those licences. But it would be at least as many as four channels and it could be as many as six, is that what you're saying? Yes, the OSAT satellites allow six. Um, I think Mr Wheatley's probably convinced um, the bureaucrats, certainly, and I think some people in Beasley's office at four is the way to go. It's then a question of whether you give that to one operator or you give it to, say, four operators. I think Glenn Wheatley is also pretty keen on that uh, House of Representatives committee recommendation, which was that, uh, uh, that the same cross-media rules that currently apply between television and newspapers should apply between uh, commercial television and pay TV. Certainly going to be some interesting politics there to Kerry. We know that um, Kerry Packer himself is about to take over Channel 9. He's got a, a pay TV service uh, called Sky TV that at the moment goes to pubs and hotels. Um, so he'd be very interested in being a player. The other two channels, 7 and 10, well, they're in, in deep debt and have no money, basically, to spend on any sort of pay TV service. So their strategy is essentially to try and hold up the decision. So, uh, but, but there is still a real chance that, uh, that despite that recommendation, the commercial uh, networks could be invited in to participate in pay TV? I think TV? so, yes. At near the end of the foreign TV debate, where, as you recall, they lowered the 20% or lowered the foreign ownership limit to 20%, um, Mr Hawke promised to Sam Chisholm from Channel 9 and Bob Campbell, the head of the Seven Network, that they would be looked after, quote unquote. Um, when the government came to look, up, look at the pay TV debate uh, or decision this but, year. But it's a touchy one again, isn't it? I mean, the history of, uh, of uh, Labor media policy in the past few years has been riddled with charges and counter charges of cronyism. Certainly will be, and I'm sure they'll be around this time, Kerry. OK, but uh, what's, what's your tip as to the earliest that we would actually see pay TV operating in people's homes? Well, the uh, satellite goes up, I think, late January. I no, beg your pardon. Um, December next year and then the following satellite goes up early in 92 so you're looking at early 92 as the start for any pay TV service. So, so at least 18 months away still? That's why. Right. Okay Tom thanks for talking with us. Thank you. And now let's take a look at what's making headlines in tomorrow's newspapers apart from Tom's story. The Courier Mail leads with allegations heard in a Brisbane court that a former auditor with collapsed merchant bank Rothwells conspired to defraud the public